Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would respond to some patron emails. But first, let's introduce what this podcast is called. It is called Psychology in Seattle, and I am your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. This email is from an anonymous woman. She said, uh, so I, so the so background on this email is I recently published a um, two episodes on a deep dive on narcissistic personality disorder. The collective two episodes amounted to, I think, eight or nine hours of, of dense talking and um, eventually like 90 pages of notes that I was working off of. It was the... Uh, culmination of years of of study and um, treatment of narcissistic personality disorder and reading books and theory and all this kind of stuff in the history. And so I've been getting a fair amount of emails and I thought that this one was worth reading on the air. She wanted to be anonymous. And she says here, it's a long email and I'm going to read it and I think it's it's worth reading and I'm going to chime in every now and then. She writes, as a person on the spectrum of narcissism, it was great to hear an episode about myself, smiley face. Pathological narcissism definitely runs in my family. I suspect my mom's mom was on the spectrum as well as my dad's dad. So just chiming in here. Yes, this is a common scenario for someone with narcissistic personality spectrum. I'm calling it spectrum. I I haven't seen people rephrase it that way, you know, autism spectrum is an official term. But before it was an official term in the DSM, it used to be a, a term that was used in the literature. And so I might propose that we start using narcissistic personality spectrum and borderline personality spectrum. I mean, just so you know, the, the original uh, terminology of borderline and narcissistic personality were, were spectrums. But more lately, they've been codified in the DSM as you know, the, the personality disorder in, in which it, it needs to be of a certain, above a certain threshold, which is at the higher end of the spectrum. And so we don't want to ignore the fact that just because someone doesn't rise above the spectrum, it doesn't mean they don't have those personality traits. We tend in the, in the parlance of my field, we call it personality disorder traits, meaning that they don't meet the full criteria, but they have some of the traits. But I find that to be confusing terminology because by definition that's saying that someone with pers the, pers the full-blown personality disorder doesn't have the traits. So that doesn't make any sense, right? It, it should just be spectrum and above a certain threshold, say at the 70 percentile mark, whatever we kind of determine that to be in a sort of soft science way, is where we use the label that the DSM is putting forth. Of, of the quote-unquote disorder. Anyway, so she says um, that her uh, mother's mom, so her grandmother on her mom's side and her grandfather on her dad's side, both had, um, she suspects, narcissistic personality. And this is, this is common because when you are a child of someone with narcissistic personality, one, you either develop narcissistic personality yourself or you develop a complex around people with narcissistic personality and that makes you sensitive to them and might even make you attracted to them based on projective identification and other kinds of psychodynamic mechanisms that kick in when you become attracted to particular people. So that's why it's common for um, two children of narcissistic parents to come together. All right, she goes on here. My grandmother was abandoned by her alcoholic father and raised in an orphanage separate from her siblings. So just chiming in here. So this is a, a you know, a good story or a, you know, emblematic story of someone who would develop narcissistic personality. This grandmother was abandoned by her father who was alcoholic and raised in an orphanage separate from her siblings. So she, at an early uh, child was raised by an alcoholic father. I don't know where the where the mother was. Maybe the mother wasn't around. I don't know. But the this woman had an alcoholic father. And when you when you're the the thing about alcoholism is we tend to think of it as like oh that person's suffering from alcoholism. Like they have some sort of some sort of disease or something. And 
you know, that's one way of looking at it. But whenever I hear that, what I what I suspect, and there's no way to know, is that they were using alcohol to uh, cope with something. And that that's either PTSD themselves or at some sort of trauma or neglect or, or something or even narcissism themselves, because narcissism carries with it a, a deep suffering with it. So. Uh, so when I hear that this grandmother had an alcoholic father, I wonder what other personality traits he had that would make it so it, it would make it hard for him to love his daughter in a uh, in a in a healthy way. And also, being an alcoholic is also going to impair your ability to parent, to parent, you know, and fully pay attention to your child. And he abandoned her, just flat out abandoned her, and she was raised in an orf- orphanage away from his siblings. And so that neglect is going to uh, cause a deep disruption in someone's personality, particularly if they're younger, preschool age, that will uh, lead to the foundation of of many personality disorders, one of which can be narcissistic personality. She goes on here, uh, she, she goes on to say, she has always been the, the grandmother. The grandmother has always been incredibly loving towards me and my siblings, but my mother described her as cold, competitive, and played obvious favorites with her children. Okay, just chiming in here. Again, very common scenario. So as I talked about in full detail, the narcissistic personality disorder deep dives, which are only available to patrons, by the way, uh, at, le- at least after the first half hour or something. It's very common for this to happen because when you are suffering from narcissistic personality as a younger person, say 20s and 30s, and you're having children yourself, you're much less self-aware, you're, you're suffering to a greater degree in all likelihood, and are not able to, to parent, your, you're compromised, and so it's really hard to parent your kids and well enough when they're young that can um, you know be good for them. And so, uh, so then the, so then this woman, you know, so the grandmother has children, doesn't parent her, you know, she's cold, she's competitive, played favorites with her kids. And then she grows up and then she proceeds to be much nicer to her grandchildren. And there's a number of different possibilities here. One is, is that people tend to have less projective identification with their grandchildren because their grandchildren aren't as close to them and they already have their children to uh, use projective identification with uh, defensively. Listen to my episodes on projective identification for more information because it's complicated. But anyway, also grandchildren tend to see their grandparents at their best, right? You, unless you live with them full time for a long period of time, you're going to see them when they're uh, when they're at their best, when they're you know behaving at their best. They're they're not in a bad mood, and they don't, they're not responsible for you and all that kind of, you're not going to trigger them and you're not going to upset them the way that uh, people will upset their own parents, right? Um, also, they might be really trying to uphold a, uh, you know, perfect image um, in your mind of them. You know, they might be really trying to socialize you to see them as these perfect human beings because that's part of their disorder, right? Uh, this, is, this isn't a horrible thing. It makes it so that you get the best version of your grandmother. But I've seen this before many, many times. People will, you know, they'll have parents that will describe their parents as being terrible and narcissistic or borderline or some other thing. And then the grandkids are like, you know, I just don't see that. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that the damage wasn't done. Um, going on through email, email here. I see a lot of dependency and narcissism in my own mother. Uh, again, just chiming in here. Yeah, totally common. Uh, as I said before, if you are the child of someone with narcissistic personality disorder or any of the cluster Bs, histrionic, borderline, uh, this will lead to neglect. It provides a certain amount of modeling, uh, particularly emotional uh, neglect uh, at an early age and might even throw in some difficulty, actual abuse, chaos. And that is the, um, the fertile ground for any personality disorder Uh, or, and lots of other conditions later on, including narcissistic going on through email, but she has been very loving and, and empathic mother to me. So not only is she narcissistic, but she's also um, loving to me. I don't know much about my grandmother's childhood, but my father described him as, oh, I, sorry. I don't know much about my grandfather's childhood. So she's switching over to her dad's father. 
But my father described him as a brute who frequently went into tirades and beat him and his sister, made them into his personal servants, wanted them to behave and think the way that he deemed right, and was very powerful and charming to the outside world. Okay, just chiming in here. Yeah, very common, as I talked about fully in the narcissistic personality disorder deep dive episodes. People, some, some people with narcissistic personality spectrum will manage their narcissistic supply in the outside world by being very nice to people and being, and being very charming. But then when they go home, they take out their frustrations with their family, not because they're evil, but because they're truly suffering immensely. And they are walking around as a raw nerve, feeling scared and hurt. And their defensive structure necessitates the notion that they're superior to everyone, including their family, and that other people are to blame. And they feel completely justified in, in their uh, anger and abuse of their family members. If you want the full sort of ex explanation of that, go to the deep dives. Uh, going on with your email. My own father is similar and was frequently verbally and mildly physically abusive throughout my childhood. He also rarely sees things from an alternate from an alternate alternatives perspective unless he is guided towards it in just the right way. Um, so just chiming in here, yeah, this is a thing I've seen. Again, not everyone with narcissistic personality has this, but people with narcissistic personality can be extremely rigid. Um, one because they have to believe that they're superior in order to cope, but also because to admit that they're wrong or to sway their opinion based on someone else's input implies that they were wrong or that they're they're not a genius or that they had wrong thinking or something. And for the most of us, we struggle with that anyway, right? People without narcissistic personality struggle with that. I mean, just anybody has a hard time admitting they're wrong. I mean, all you have to do is watch Happy Days and you know, watch Fonzie to, to see that, you know, so you old people out there will will know that reference, but the, it's hard for anybody, you know, everyone is, is narcissistic in that way. But for people with narcissistic personality, it's particularly difficult, not because admitting they're wrong is difficult, but because admitting they're wrong actually destroys their defensive structure and makes them have to think about the fact that they're flawed, which behind that very thin veil of grandiosity is a deep, empty, suffering horribleness and so to admit that they're that they were wrong and to apologize particularly is for them to fall off that cliff into the abyss and again i described that in full detail in the episode uh she goes on to say he excessively praises us kids but can also be deeply shaming when we act in ways which are contrary to what he deems the right way but at times he is also incredibly loving and clearly cares about his family Okay, just chiming in here. Yeah, again, as I talked about before, people with narcissistic personality do indeed have empathy. They don't lack empathy. They just have difficult time accessing it, and they have an immature version of empathy. And they absolutely have attachment needs. They're not monsters. I mean, as I talked about in the deep dives, we often will prop up people like, you know, uh, Charles Manson or... Um, just just other monsters in, that are, quote unquote, good examples of narcissistic personality, which is completely wrongheaded. If, we, if, if Charles Manson is a good example of someone with narcissistic personality, then every, every hour a new Charles Manson would be in the news because they would be doing all these horrible things. The fact is, is 99.99999% of people with narcissistic personality don't do anything close to what, to what Charles Manson did. Uh, most of them are just out there existing just like everyone else, and they have jobs and they have families, and, and they are bothersome to people around them, but not, not you know, even close to the, you know, to the level of, of, um, of Charles Manson. Anyway. Uh, so, um, so when they lack narcissistic supply, then they're apt to be mean to others, right? You know, and they're, they're going to be mean like the way that, uh, this patron, her father was mean to her. And really, you know, everyone's like this. E everyone, everyone needs a narcissistic supply, not just people with narcissistic personality. It's just much worse, much, much worse for people with narcissistic personality. 
you know, for example, when I have, as a professor, I see a lot of people graduating from my program and they're at the beginning of their careers and they're, they're applying for jobs as a therapist. They're trying to find a job as a therapist. Incidentally, everyone in my program, uh, for the most part, gets a job. Um, one, because I would like to think that we educate them very well, but two, because they, uh, because the jobs are actually pretty abundant in the Seattle area and the low, the sort of entry level jobs don't pay that much. And so they, there's a high level of turnover. And so there's frequently people vacating those positions and then our graduates fill those positions. Anyway, um, so I see a lot of these graduates applying for jobs and I'm with them, uh, close to them, emotionally with them as they go through that. And what I see is that their self-esteem plummets as they start to apply for jobs. And this isn't just for therapists, it's really for anyone. I've seen people, uh, you know, um, I've seen perfectly self-confident people when they start to apply for a position, their self-esteem plummets to like 10% of its normal rate. And they become extremely um, regressed and think that they're worthless. They're just like, oh, please, I want this job. You know, the, every, their entire self-esteem and self-worth hangs on them getting this position. Um, I imagine it's similar to being an actor and going through auditions. And people will, so this is narcissistic supply. We believe that we're special and we want this thing and we believe we deserve it. And and we're ex extremely sensitive to the approval of other people. This is narcissistic personality. And when things are going badly, we get in a bad mood, we feel hurt and we get irritable. We might take that out on people around us. So it's exactly the same for everyone else, except people with narcissistic personality disorder and, and those on the spectrum just have it like a hundred times worse. All right, going on with the email here. Uh, then there's me. As a teenager and young adult, I was highly competitive. The focus of my perfectionism frequently shifted. Initially, it was brains. I wanted to be the smartest in the class. Then it was appearance. I would be crushed when people complimented or even noticed my sister, but not me. I'm also a hypochondriac with poor eye contact. You get the picture. Uh, just chiming in here. Yeah, uh, wonderful self-awareness, uh, pa anonymous patron. And, um, you know, for more information on this, go to the deep dives. Uh, for those of you who weren't listening, this, this patron did listen to the deep dive. That's why she's writing in. Anyway, more emails here, or part of the email here. After graduating college and discovering more about narcissistic personality disorder, I started to deeply fear that I had it. It was a constant source of anxiety. Eventually, I resolved to go to therapy and brought it up. My therapist who did her graduate thesis on narcissism does not believe I have the disorder or, or any other disorder other than general anxiety. Okay, just chiming in here. Yeah, it's possible that you don't. Or it's, again, as I talked about fully in the episodes, there's no such thing as having it or not having it. There's only some, there's only what, how we, not, how we uh, story or narrativize your experience. You're talking about extremely subjective experiences and I am subjectively, not objectively, listening to it and trying to understand it. And so when someone comes to my office and I'm assessing them for any, any personality type, including narcissistic, I'm not, I'm not diagnosing them with something that's hard science. I'm, I'm labeling something that I subjectively believe to be true. Uh, and I would never claim that someone quote unquote has it. It's just my opinion based on my cultural uh, spot, you know, and, and my own ideas of things and stuff. And so, so this idea of having it or not is, is, is wrongheaded anyway, but, but having said that, you know, would I find that you have it? It's, you know, hard to say. So the fact that your therapist said you didn't have it, you know, um, could mean that you could mean that you don't. Uh, quote unquote habit, or your therapist just has a really high threshold. You know, um, the fact that you have a lot of self awareness um, is an indication that you're not you're not high in the spectrum. People who have insight into their narcissistic personality, um, you know, the the very fact that you can admit that you have some narcissistic traits means that you have enough of an intact personality that can withstand 
the self-esteem blow to having a little bit of a flaw or even a massive flaw, right? The fact that you can uh, manage that internally and even admit it to me anonymously over email. Actually, you, you did include your name. I'm not saying your name online because you are on the air because you asked me not to, but, but the fact that you can do all those things means that you were raised well enough when you were a young child that you do have a sense of self enough to be able to withstand that. So your therapist might have seen that you just don't rise above that threshold, which, you know, is, is um, not a bad clinical uh, decision to make. Or your therapist um, did actually think you had it, but didn't want to burden you with the, with the stigma of the diagnosis. Um, and I've done that before, too. People have come to me and said, oh, I, I think I suffer from this or that. And, and in my head, I'm thinking, well, you know, one could say that you do, but I don't know if it helps for us to, to story your ex, you know, experience that way. Maybe looking at you in a more strengths-based way is is more helpful to you. And so it's not lying to the client, but it's it's framing it in a way that can be more helpful. Um, I don't do that very often. Be, one, because the main reason why I don't do that is because I don't have any stigma. I don't around narcissistic personality or borderline personality or histrionic or or bipolar or I don't I don't have any stigma around it because I know the reality and, and it's nothing to be afraid of and it's nothing to be ashamed of at all and the, you know half of Americans at some point will qualify for some disorder in the DSM so it's extremely common it's you know it's 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 just like being a normal person to have a disorder so to me I you know, I wouldn't protect someone from the knowledge of their disorder because I just don't believe that there's that there's anything to worry about. But but some people do have those you know stigmas around it. Um, but I feel like normally I'm able to actually communicate in a way to someone to mitigate that um, that shame and that stigma. You know, I'll say. You know, someone will come to me and they'll be like, "Yo, my my past therapist said I might have borderline," and I went online and. Uh, and I, I, you know, maybe I have it and I just feel like, oh my God, like what's wrong with me? Every, you know, people online are talking about borderline people they are crazy and you can't treat them and stuff. And all. And if I think they're ready for it, I might say something like, well, you know, you may or may not have borderline and, you know, we can talk about that over, over time, but I'm here to tell you that everything on the internet is wrong or 99.999% of the messages on the internet are either wrong or too simplistic. And I've worked successfully with people with borderline personality, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's really quite a common thing, and it's a result of trauma. And it's a borderline is just like narcissistic; it's a normal reaction to a very difficult circumstance. You know, having narcissistic personality, having borderline personality, is not something that people like wake up and decide like, "Ooh, I want to be difficult with people," or "Ooh, I want to annoy people with my personality." No, nobody is born that way. People are born one, you know, not wanting in the conscience, conscious sense, but we are trying to adapt to our surroundings. And when our surroundings are extremely difficult and require us to uh, develop, you know, very elaborate defenses against our environment, some of those defenses will sustain into adulthood that are no longer needed and will annoy people around them. You know, our, our adult life might be, um, you know, much better than it was when we were four or three years old, but our defensive structure hasn't adjusted yet. And that's because they become habit in the brain and they, and with personality disorders, they become pervasive ideas and notions and reactivities that are uh, foundational to our personality. And it's, it's, it's. Um, impossible to, uh, you know, use willpower to overcome that, you know? So, um, so I'll explain that to people who have borderline or narcissistic. And what I say is like, yeah, don't listen to the world or the internet. They're all um, misinformed, but uh, you know, understand that if, if we use that language here in therapy, that 
I, you know, I'm using it in that sense, in that sense of it being just a normal reaction to a difficult circumstance. It's the same as PTSD. There's a lot less stigma around PTSD. There's still stigma for sure, but a lot less. And most people are like today, most educated people today are just like, oh yeah, I get that. When someone is, uh, you know, they go through war and they, they see their friends killed or they almost get killed themselves, it makes sense that when they come back from war that there's psychological effects, that, you know, that all makes sense. But somehow when it comes to being abused as a young child, neglected as a young child, mistreated, lots of chaos, for some reason when the idea of just like, um, and therefore someone has narcissistic personality or borderline personality or histrionic, somehow that idea is like, not as understood in society and that's wrong and it's exactly the same thing if you go through a difficult thing like war or you go through a difficult thing like being mistreated by or neglected by an alcoholic you know parent group uh, there's going to be a later effect and that that's all borderline narcissistic pers- uh, you know PTSD complex PTSD attachment disorders um, even antisocial to some extent, you know, that's all it is. Now, some people will say, oh, Kirk, you know, you don't understand. There are studies out there that, that prove that um, people are born antisocial or they're born bipolar or they're born this way or that way. Um, and yeah, uh, there's no way to know is the thing at this point. Uh, there seem to be some genetic factors, but the vast, vast majority of people that I've treated and research supports this have been through difficult times. Now, some of them have might not have been through overt abuse, but um, everyone that I've treated has has had a perceived experience of difficulty growing up. The other thing is, is you don't have to have difficulty in order to have uh, a problem um, when you're three or four. So you can grow up in a family that's very loving, that's um, that doesn't have any alcoholism in it, that is always there, very stable. And if your parents just don't pay enough attention to you when you are going through emotional experiences, that can be enough of emotional neglect to create personality disorders later in life. You know, I'm not talking like minor not paying attention to your children. I'm talking like a a sustained, um, maybe even every time you go through an emotional experience as a child, the parents either turn away from you or they have kind of weird reactions to it or uh, subtly rejecting reactions to it. And you do that enough and you, you provide no other venue like a grandparent or an older sibling that can kind of pick up the slack. That child will have the experiences that can lead to um, the sort of lack of self that can be the precursor to to a number of personality disorders. So it doesn't have to. So when people do research on this sort of thing, it's like they will say, "Well, you know, this person grew up and they didn't have any, uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't have any abuse in their childhood." And I'm thinking, well, that that's that's overt. Uh, and but the thing is, is I also don't believe that I'm right because. What I'm proposing is a is a very broad understanding of what mistreatment can be for children, and it's impossible to measure that, right? I mean, it's even kind of impossible to measure abuse because a lot of abuse can be emotional and verbal, and you know, every every parent gets angry at their kids. So, what's the line between getting angry at a kid versus emotional abuse? And there's just no scientific line, right? There's a scientific line between you know a the a gaseous uh, you know, substance versus a solid versus a liquid. And I know some of you, you know, physics people out there will say, actually, there's other forms, you know, there's like uh, liminal states or whatever, but you get my picture. You know, there's, there are, you know, we breathe in a gas, we drink water, which is a liquid, and this table is a solid. You know, we have these, you know, pretty uh, firm, very minor overlapping uh, categories, but well, when it comes to personality or experience or abuse versus not abuse, these are things that are not categorical. They're not you just can't do it. Plus, as I've talked about fully in the narcissistic personality episodes, it all depends on the perception of the child. A child can go through something very difficult, but if they perceive it as something that is done with love or with care or it's within a safe environment 
then the child will, will perceive it not as abusive. It will be, you know, from the outside looking at it, it might look like abuse, but it, but it won't be perceived as such like that. That's why when American researchers look at cult- cultures from around the world, say China or Korea, they will look at them and say, oh my God, those parents are abusing all those kids. But when they actually measure the outcomes for the kids, they find that that those kids, even though they were quote unquote abused, don't have the same outcomes as abused kids in the United States. And so it's not just hitting your kid, right? It's not just corporal punishment or using shaming language. That's not the the marker of abuse that we should be looking at. What it what it what we should be looking at is the context. What is what is the overall vibe that is being felt by the child? For example, research has found that kids in Korea, for example, or China, um, when they are be, you know, they they exist in a parenting structure that that ha- exhibits, on average, you know, we're talking about over a billion people here, so there's a lot of variation, but on average, a lot more control, and on average, a lot more uh, corporal punishment, you know, physical beatings and and spankings and whatnot, and what they find is that when that is done, that you know, a quote unquote abusive behavior that we in the United States would, would label it as, or many of us would, not all of us, of course, uh, people, liberal people in Seattle definitely would. But when that quote unquote abusive parenting is done within a family that is safe and a culture that supports it and a notion that is very strong that I'm only doing this to you, child, because I love you and I care about you. And I'm trying to help you, and I and I'm listening to you, and I don't take pleasure in beating you. You know, this is something that uh, I'm doing because I care. And when and 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 only certain people and certain cultures can kind of pull that off. If you grew up in a liberal, um, you know, passive parenting culture, it you can't just adopt that because it's a full body felt experience that you give your child as your disciplining them and and reacting to to them. And so that's why uh, when we try to measure, uh, okay, somewhat, you know, some of these people with, with borderline grew up in families where there was no abuse. It's like, well, how, how do we define abuse exactly? It's, it's hard to know. So, um, so I, what I'm saying is it's hard to know. And two, I, I, in my experience, have always found that people with, pers- you know, narcissistic, borderline histrionic, even antisocial, will have massive difficulties in childhood that are actually quite obvious. In the research and in anecdotes, I hear people talking about some people who had no difficulties as a child and have personality disorders later in life. And I suspect what really happened was there were difficulties you just can't really overtly um, measure. But at the same time, what I'm saying is, I don't know. Maybe they were born that way, but there's our current scientific technology can't suss that out really. And um, uh, other than we would have to take thousands of infants and raise them in different circumstances and abuse some and not some and take genetic markers and you know put them in a different biodome and raise them under different circumstances and we just can't do that and so we'll just probably never know the answer to these questions you know unless in, until we come up with computer models that can model all this stuff um, in a in a computer and, and even then by then you're actually fully forming full consciousnesses consciousnesses in a virtual environment and is that ethical because because you're creating basically a a creature in a computer simulation and then you then you proceed to abuse it you know it'd be like taking data on um star trek next generation and saying well he's he's a you know it's a machine so i can proceed to emotionally abuse it over and over again as if that's okay. And, uh, you know, so we might not ever know the answer to these questions. And, you know, the, the world is a, the universe is a mysterious place and that's okay. You know, be, uh, having something unknown to us humans doesn't feel good to us, but once you accept that, it, it's okay. Um, I want to go on with the email, but we need to take a break. So let's do that. <music> All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast yet, uh, do so now. Go to patreon.com, become a patron. A lot of you have decided to take that leap recently, I think in response to my narcissistic personality episode. Um, 
it was kind of interesting, you know, once I posted it, I, I was like, oh, I'm finally done, you know, 10 hour, you know, eight hours of talking, nine hours of talking, all the editing and, you know, six, seven years of research and thinking about this episode and 22 years in this, in this, you know, field, I'm finally done. And I, you know, I post it and it just feels so good. And, um, and I just sort of moved on with my life, you know, did, got to some chores I'd been putting off and, you know, cause, cause recording those episodes requires sort of an all day, several days kind of a thing, you know, researching, reading, thinking, rehearsing, note taking, organizing notes, talking, piecing together and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, cause even though I talked for eight or nine hours that those eight or nine hours were spread out over a few weeks, you know, anyway. Um, so when I was done, I just sort of put it behind me and tried to forget about it because I just wanted to move on with my life. But then um, every day there's like a, there's a whole new batch. Uh, there's a, there's been an acceleration in people becoming patrons because they want access to those episodes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, that's great. You know, that there are some people that really want to hear that and value, value those kinds of episodes. And so, and I have a bunch of other episodes coming up and I've done many in the past. Some of you have asked me to do other deep dives on other personality disorders and what I, you might be new to the show. I just want to tell you that I've, I've done deep dives on passive aggressive personality disorder. Uh, I think I've done one on borderline. Um, I've done one on histrionic that one on hist histrionic is, was fascinating to me to learn everything about hysteria and Freud and Breuer and going back to the Egyptians and the Greeks and, and, you know, his histrionic comes from hister, which is your, uh, which is your uterus. <laughs> and uh, you know, so histrionic or hysteria is, was originally this idea about your uterus <laughs> and was, you know, only for women, right? And culture and the way we, you know, the very first patient in psychoanalysis was diagnosed as having hysteria. And so just all of that was just so fascinating. Anyway, I've done lots of deep dives on personality disorders and many more to come. So um, go to the archive for that. When you become a patron, you get uh, instructions on how to access all that. And plus on our website, there are pages that are only a, only accessible to patrons. So there you can find um, all the deep dives are um, sort of sectioned off on particular pages. Because uh, because for the patron feed on your phone has all the episodes, not just the deep dives. Anyway, so let's get back to the email here. So, so we just got done reading the part of your email where you were talking about how your therapist didn't believe that you had narcissistic personality. And what I was saying is, yeah, maybe you don't, maybe you do, maybe your therapist had a high threshold. I suspect your therapist just had a high threshold. That, that would be my guess based on your email here. Okay, going on with your email. I'm still a little unsure, but know that I'm at least self-aware and can reduce my symptoms. So you're, she's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm still unsure if I have narcissistic personality disorder, but at least I'm you know, self-aware and I can reduce whatever you know, narcissistic symptoms I have. I no longer fear the narcissistic label. I recognize I have narcissistic and borderline traits, which need to be addressed if I, wanna, if I want a happier, healthier life. So just chiming in here. Yeah, uh, there's research has found that there's a pretty big overlap between narcissistic and borderline. And also, I find that at lower levels on the spectrum, people will tend to have both because as I talked about, they come from the same place. They come from the same mistreatment. It's just a slightly different, they're just slightly different coping structures and, and defensive structures to those difficulties and, and the lack of self that's developed early in life. And so, um, and, and they c can, at lower levels, the narcissism isn't so strong that you, that you don't necessarily deny your preoccupied attachment on other people. Anyway, going on with your email here. I also understand my family better and am better able to navigate conflict with them and understand them with more compassion. I have worries though. I worry because I want to have children. I worry because I dream of becoming a therapist one day. Okay, just charming in here. Uh, so what, I, what I'll say to this is there's no reason to believe that you're not going to be a wonderful uh, parent and a wonderful therapist. The fact is, is no one emerges from childhood unscathed. No one emerges from their childhood without wounds. We all have, as a result, a growing edge or, a, or some 
issues that need to be healed from. Everyone has something, and this is your thing. And it doesn't preclude at all you having children or being a therapist. I, I know many parents and therapists who are on the narcissistic spectrum or the borderline spectrum who are wonderful parents and wonderful therapists. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't run into problems because of their personality disorder or their or their you know personality spectrum. It does for sure. It's you know personality disorders are not a walk in the park. They they produce a lot of suffering, but but life produces a lot of suffering. And in my experience, everyone is suffering. I don't know a single person. I, I I'm, I'm here to tell you. I don't know a single human being. And maybe I'm surprised at even thinking about this notion. I don't know a single human being. Once I get to know him well enough who isn't deeply suffering. And this idea makes me want to cry just thinking about it. It's like everyone I know, including myself, has something that they're healing from that is not healing, <laughs> that or, is, or that is so hard to heal that it, it, it takes too long. There, no one lives long enough to heal those wounds. You know, I, I know people who are, you know, in their 70s, 80s, who have been working on healing from wounds from their childhood uh, effectively and doing really well and doing a lot of hard work. And they're still, they're probably just like 15% healed. Everyone is like this. Everyone has something. I don't know a single person who doesn't. And so there's nothing unusual about you that you have these wounds that result in a defensive structure of narcissism and borderline. So, you know, if, if wounds and personality problems were a you know, um, a, were a, a no-go, were a deal breaker for becoming a therapist or a parent, then no one would be a therapist and no one would be a parent and the human race would die off. But now that isn't to say that you, we're all just off the hook. You know, we need to be self-aware, particularly if we're therapists and particularly if we're parents, probably more so for parents, right? More self-awareness. We need to be responsive to feedback. We need to question our ideas. We need to you know, get support. We need, you know, ask people to observe us and really listen to those, to that feedback, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Another going on with email here. I worry because I really do want to be a good person while paradoxically recognizing that being a good person might mean letting go of trying to be the best good person. Just chiming in here. I get chills reading this sentence. It is extremely insightful and I've never thought about it this way. So, in case you missed it, she's saying, I want to I want to be a good person. But paradoxically, I have to realize that being a good person is not the same as being the best good person. Because narcissistically, I'm gonna win a, I'm gonna want to be the best good person. And this is, you know, the self-awareness um, conundrum for narcissistic personality spectrum people. Because as they realize that they have issues, they will have, at the, in their good moments, they will realize with enough support that, that they can and should work on their issues. But because their defensive structure will latch onto things that um, will lend itself to perfectionism and grandiosity and being the best at it, they will um, make mistakes and sort of fall into that groove of, of, grandiosity and being perfect and being the best at something rather than really calming down and trying to uh, heal from the wounds, you know? It, it'd be, I guess, practically speaking, it's like um, a narcissistic personality person realizes they have narcissistic personality and they go to therapy and the therapist, you know, proceeds to talk about healing from their wounds and stuff. And then the client sort of gauges what the therapist wants to hear, you know, what the therapist is looking for in terms of what would indicate that the therapy is going well. And this is all unconscious. The client doesn't necessarily know they're doing this. And so the client proceeds to um, figure out what the therapist wants to hear and, and starts to say those things, you know, starts to use the phrases that the therapist then will say, oh, wow, you're really progressing fast through therapy. But in fact... The, the client isn't actually progressing. They're just learning how to please the therapist and look like the best client in the therapist's eyes. So that's just one way in which the, uh, this you know, emailer is, is encapsulating this idea. You know, we, you know, she says, I really do want to be a good person, 
but paradoxically, I need to let go of trying to be the best good person. <laughs> and it's, it, again, it's genius. That's just the genius idea. Uh, not to, you know, pump you uh, with your narcissistic supply, but, um, you know. Okay, going on with your email. It's hard, and I know I have a long journey ahead, one that might require sacrifices. But I just wanted to share this with you and let you know how much you and your podcast inspire me. You teach me to look at the world more compassionately and help me laugh while doing it. Uh, end of email. I can't tell you how much that means to me. That's truly meaningful to me to uh, hear that from you. Uh, that's the main reason why I do this podcast. There's a lot of reasons why I do the podcast. I like to yammer. I, I'm, you know, slightly on the spectrum. I talked about on the deep dives why, you know, I'm about 5% in. I would imagine a lot of podcasters are, honestly. Um, but the but my core self, the the core meaning and the, the deeper um, purpose that I have for my life has always been, ever since I decided to become a therapist when I was 24, has been to just do my little part to try to make the world a better place, you know, um, one conversation at a time, I guess. And I never really know if I'm succeeding, but I you know, sleep well at night knowing that I've tried and I will die one day. If, if I know death is coming, um, I'm fairly certain that, that I will, um, feel good that I did, that I tried, you know, I, again, I'll, I'll never really know if, if it, if it worked, but I, I know that I've been trying in my, in my little way. And when I get an email like this, you know, and I hear, and I, you know, you're talking in this way and you've been to therapy before and you've been on a journey. And then my podcast is, is, you know, just a, a part of that journey with you. And that you're saying that, you know, it helps you. That is a big deal to me. Um, when I am, every episode I'm making, that is, that is what motivates me. That's why I'm trying. That's what, that's what's motivating me to explain things to people. You know, a lot of this podcast is me explaining something, you know, trying, trying to, essentially I'm teaching, I guess, but I'm not trying to teach just so that people know something, you know, most of the time. I'm not, I'm not just like, you need to know this because uh, it's good to know things, you know, so that at dinner parties, you can amaze your friends with your trivia. That That's not why I'm talking usually. What I'm trying to do is trying to help people to have more compassion for themselves and other people, because I believe deep down and based on evidence in my own life that when we understand why people act in weird ways that annoy us, it helps us to understand them better and therefore have compassion for them. When we know why we have unfortunate qualities in our own personality, we get angry too often, we're too self-critical, we're too critical of other people, we're distant, people call us overreactive, or whatever it is. Instead of just saying, oh, you know, what's wrong with me? Or you suffer from addiction, you know, instead of just going like, oh, what's wrong with me? I, I consider that to be just totally wrongheaded and a product of our culture teaching us extremely destructive, simplistic notions of, of personality and behavior. And when, when I actually try to find sources, particularly online, but even among professors, I find that there isn't this element of like, I mean, sometimes there is for sure. I mean, everything I'm telling you and everything I've ever said has, has been taught to me somewhere down the line, you know, either it was cobbled together or just directly told to me. So, so there are sources, but they're rare, you know, it's rare enough that a podcast like mine, I believe, um, has a place, you know, there's, there's this message that I'm trying to get out there, which is like, people have reasons for why they annoy you. And you have reasons for why you annoy other people. It's, it's just that simple. You have, there are reasons, there are legitimate, understandable, justifiable reasons why someone with narcissistic personality is narcissistic. There are legitimate reasons why you overreact to things and why you will get angry at people and be mean to people. There's legitimate reasons for why a bully is bullying somebody. It doesn't excuse it at all. And 
if someone does something wrong, they deserve consequences. But it, when we understand where it comes from in ourselves and other people, that is the beginning to fixing the problem. And without understanding where it comes from, we cannot fix the problem. When someone with narcissistic personality comes to me, if I saw it in the cultural manner, and frankly, the way a lot of therapists see it, I would just be like, this, this woman doesn't, she doesn't have any insight. She believes there's nothing wrong with her. She is insulting me. And I don't even know why she's in, when I ask her what she wants therapy for, she, she doesn't have any, she, she, she doesn't have any, she can't come up with anything. So, you know, I don't understand why she's in therapy. I terminate with her. So that's, or, and, or even worse, just me just looking at her and going like, man, what a, what a arrogant, horrible, self-centered, you know, entitled millennial or, you know, whatever that, whatever the label is, just like, you know, this person is a disgusting, privileged, uh, you know, terrible human being. And I just, I don't want to be around this person. You know, that, that's, that would be me reacting from the cultural understanding of, of, of why this person is the way that they are. Because basically what I'm reacting to essentially is they, I believe that this person is the way that they are because they chose it. They chose to be arrogant. They chose to be not self-aware. They chose to hurt my feelings by making me as a therapist feel like I'm inadequate and I don't know anything. They chose to do that because, and, and then you go, well, well, why would someone choose that? Well, essentially what we believe, and no one would say this out loud, I believe, is that we believe that these people are evil. We believe that they are evil and that they have evil intent. They have bad intentions. And this is, again, people wouldn't say this, you know, no therapist that I know is going to be like, I have an evil client who makes me feel like shit and I want to terminate with them. You know, I don't, I don't know any therapist who would say that, but their language basically uh, says that to me. Whereas if me and other experts that work with narcissistic personality, including uh, this patron's therapist um, that she was talking about. When you understand where this com comes from, what, what you, you don't see anything like that. What you see is, okay, I, I notice that I'm feeling inadequate as a therapist. I, I notice that this, that this client is often refuting what I'm saying, or the client over talks, or the client doesn't have eye contact with me, or the client doesn't really have any goals. What does that mean exactly? I wonder where that's coming from. I know that it's difficult for me to work with this client, but you know, is that what is that? You know, what is what projective identification is happening? What sort of what sort of issue is going on in this client that's that's sort of bleeding out and affecting me? The client doesn't have eye contact. The client talks a lot. The client comes across to me as arrogant. I have a lot of ideas that this client is arrogant. Why? Why are those thoughts coming up in my head? I wonder what this is. You know, let's start testing around with maybe this is on maybe this is narcissistic spectrum here. Let's let's start looking at this. Let's start, and then where you know where. So what was it like when you were growing up? Oh, okay, alcoholic father, narcissistic mother. Da 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 da. Okay, so now I'm starting to piece together a conceptualization, and and then I understand through my education, experience, supervision, training that. When all these things are present, what likely is happening underneath all this is a deep suffering and a deep emptiness and a deep abyss that they're worried about falling into, that they sometimes do fall into. And the only way they can prevent themselves from falling off that cliff or whatever, you know, they're standing on this thin ice that, uh, that is above the abyss is this built up defensive structure around grandiosity and not needing other people. You know, they, they deny the need of other people because if they admit they need other people, that creates a crack in the ice and they fall into the abyss, which is deep suffering. And so they're walking around terrified of that. And so them talking over me, them not doing eye contact, them, you know, giving me this vibe, them giving off an arrogant uh, persona, them blaming other people for their problems. It's, they're all, you know, they're just dancing on this thin ice and they're terrified and they're shaking in their boots, but they can't let on that they're shaking in their boots because that would um, alert to themselves in particular, but also to other people that, they, that there's something wrong with them, which again would cause the ice to crack. 
and and being in therapy alone is is a big step for them and i just need to re- relax and take some time be patient and and from that compassion i am able to actually begin to help that person with narcissistic personality what i'm describing to you is what it's like to treat someone with narcissistic personality not everyone but you know a, a common thing it's similar with borderline or histrionic and i guess even antisocial although that's not my specialty my specialty is more histrionic borderline narcissistic and that's what i'm describing to you and so once i understand compassionately where this comes from then now I have a way of conceptualizing the way I feel. I have a, I have a way of conceptualizing the, what they're doing. I have a way of conceptualizing the, the, the kind of weird angles that therapy takes sometimes. And I have a way of conceptualizing the long-term nature of what this means. I have a way of conceptualizing their triggers and, and knowing how to avoid that and why they would be upset. I have a way of conceptualizing the need for a relationship alliance and, and deep attachment and relationship rupture management and counter-transference management and just all the relationship stuff. And then I, and I have a way of interpreting success in therapy. You know, after a year, I might not see much success, but that's typical for people with borderline personality or narcissistic because it, they, they've had a lifetime of this personality and to, to basically uh, shift their personality and help them heal and give them a sense of self. This, this takes a lot more time. When, when you're two or three years old, it only takes you, you know, a few years to develop a self. Well, when you're 40, uh, the, the fact that you don't have a self or a sense of yourself, and for more information on what I mean by sense of self, listen to the narcissistic personality episodes. But anyway, the, uh, to, to develop that at the age of 40, it could take 20 years of therapy. And that sucks. And, and that is horrible. That's unfair, and it's uh, it, and when I talk about that to people, they're just they're just like twenty years of therapy. Are you kidding? Well, I'm here to tell you that that's even kind of a lie. It it probably takes more like fifty years of therapy, or there's no amount of therapy that will actually help someone develop a self after never having developed it. And but after twenty years or ten years or I don't know whatever length of time, there's enough work that's been done to give some relief to that thin ice so that they don't have to be, you know, it, it, it pulls them away from the edge of the cliff or it, it makes the ice thinner or something, or it starts to bring up the bottom of the abyss closer to the, you know, to the ice so that when you do fall, you don't fall as far or something, you know, I don't know where the metaphor is going, but my point is, is that compassion, no, here's my point. My point is, is that understanding compels compassion. So I don't have compassion just because that's my goal in life, although it kind of is. But really, by explaining things on this podcast, my hope is is that you're like, oh, I get it. And then your compassion will just naturally follow. And that's one of the things that I try to, you know, help my supervisees and trainees with. It's, it's like, because a big part of being trained as a therapist is learning how to have compassion for everyone. Because we're not taught by society to do that at all. We're taught by society to limit our compassion to very particular people in our lives. And the rest of them can go to fucking hell. <laughs> Particularly random people on the internet, right? Donald Trump can go to hell, you know? Uh, whatever. Whatever sort of political person you hate, that person can go to hell. You know, Sean Hannity can go to hell. And it's like, no, as a therapist, that's not allowed anymore. Or at least you're not going to be a good therapist if you have that that sort of vibe in your soul. You need to have compassion for some of the most difficult people to have compassion for, because often those are the people that need your help the most. And uh, it's not always this way, you know, it's not always super hard, but but uh, this is a major, you know, turning point for people and for therapists, a major growing edge for therapists. And so what I try to do is I explain to them, you don't have to white knuckle your compassion. You don't have to like willpower your, your compassion towards certain people. What you need to do is figure out people better so that your compassion just naturally follows. You know, having compassion for a puppy that is, you know, st- has its foot stuck in, under, a, you know, uh, the wheel of a car. We don't have to uh, force ourselves to have compassion for that, right? 
every human being on the planet, I'm guessing even some, you know, psychopaths will have some compassion for that puppy who has that foot stuck underneath the wheel of a car. We'll just, you know, it's just like our body just reacts and we, we got to save that puppy, you know? Well, that's when, when I understand people who annoy me, that's what I eventually come to is I see them as a puppy with their foot caught under the wheel of a car. And my compassion just naturally reacts to that. Um, I guess using this puppy mo- metaphor is imagine you imagine it's not a puppy, but like a, you know, a real mean pit bull, mean looking pit bull. And you walk up and all you see is this dog trying to, trying to bite your hand off, right? You don't see the, the foot underneath the wheel of a car. All you see is that this pit bull is trying to bite your hand off. And, uh, and you're like, ah, you know, fucking dog you're trying to kill people. You know, that's a bad dog. That's an evil dog. Okay. But, but what, you know, with more investigation, you're like, oh, wait a second. If I sort of look past the barking and the snarling and the trying to bite my hand off, I see that this dog has a foot under, has its foot underneath the wheel of a car. And then once you actually start to, you get a videotape that was videotaping this thing. And it turns out that you look exactly like the driver of the car that purposely ran over this puppy's foot. And then the puppy, is, and, then, and then you're this dog and you're like, oh, I get it. This dog thinks I'm the one that ran over its foot and it's trying to kill me because, because it's upset at me. Or even looking even further, if you could actually talk to the dog and say, like, why are you trying to bite my hand off? And the pit bull would say, I'm not trying to bite your hand off. I'm trying to get you to get back in this fucking car and drive it off my foot because aren't you the driver of this, of this car? And you're like, no, I'm not the driver of this car. I'm, I just look like... Okay, so as people know, when I start down a road of a metaphor or an analogy, I never know where it's going to head. And sometimes it works out well, and sometimes it goes disastrous. And this one, I think, kind of works out well, but it's bizarre. (laughs) But it works with my conceptualization of just like, you know, someone is on the road when I'm driving down the road. I'm I'm hitting into another analogy. God knows where this is going. I'm I'm driving down the road, and, and I, you know, change lanes, and I feel like I give enough room to the car behind me but the car behind me flips out and starts honking the horn and drives up next to me and flips me off. And I'm just like, Oh God, you know, like what's, well, as I learn more about human beings, when I see that person flipping me off, calling me an asshole, uh, I had one woman call me a chink once that was great. And, um, and you know, I should actually mention just so you know, cause some people on YouTube are like, Oh, that white guy talking about that. I just want to tell you, I'm not white. <laughs> I'm as white as Obama. Let's just put it that way. I'm half white, half Japanese American. So um, just so everyone knows, I, I don't know if it matters to people, but um, but anyway, so I guess you should know with the last name Honda. I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, <laughs> so when I see that person flipping me off and calling me a chink and, you know, I, I have a normal reaction. I'm not I'm not Gandhi, I'm not Jesus, but I'm, you know, I have a reaction like, oh, fuck, you know, what's wrong with you? But if I have a second to, to think, I'll, what I see is, man, that person is suffering. There, there's something, something is behind that aggression that is deeply, deeply disturbing to them. And they, they were either abused as kids and somehow this triggered that for them. They got in a car wreck a couple years ago, and they were in the hospital for six months. And I'm reminded, or their their mother died in a car wreck in a similar manner, or they are, you know, struggling with work, and their sleep schedule is horrible, and no one is listening to them, and they're, uh, you know, they're going through a divorce, and no one has hugged them in five years, and they're just a walking raw nerve, and I just happen to be that last straw. And it doesn't excuse their behavior, but once you see it, once you see that foot underneath the wheel of the car, you have compassion, right? And human beings, 
when they present this behavior, they don't show us that foot underneath the wheel of the car. One, because it doesn't exist physically, right? Because it's all in their head, right? But once you see it, once you start to really know that that is where 99% of the time, that's where it's coming from, then you're not trying to have compassion for that person while they're calling you a chink. You just have compassion. And when you have that compassion, you can change the world. Because when we have our typical reactivity to things out of misunderstanding about other human beings, we perpetuate the problem. I flip him off. I, you know, pull out a gun or we crash into each other or, you know, I am with my spouse and my spouse is yelling at me. And instead of seeing that foot underneath the wheel of the car, I'm just seeing my spouse as being neglecting and unfair and evil and terrible and, you know, typically inconsiderate as he or she always is. And then I react against it. How dare you? You know, you always, and this is never going to work, and I can't stand you. And we just perpetuate this this misunderstanding and, and reinforce it, really, because with our anger, it looks like we don't care. You know, as that person is flipping me off on the road, now my foot is underneath the wheel of the car, right? They've They've ran over my foot, and now I'm hurt. And I'm like, I didn't mean to, and... And why are you yelling at me? And I, I, now I'm afraid and you've made me afraid and now my feelings are hurt. Well, I'm not going to show that, right? I'm not going to look at the guy in the car next, next to me and go like, and I, I'm not going to, a tear isn't going to fall down my, <laughs> my face. I'm going to flip him off too, right? I'm going to get angry I'm gonna, or I'm going to ignore him and go like, oh, you know, you're an asshole or I'm going to call 911 or whatever. But I'm definitely not going to be like, oh, you know, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm saying this facetiously. It, that's what I should be doing is I should be going, oh, sorry, I didn't, one, I didn't realize this would upset you. Otherwise I wouldn't have done it. Two, I thought I, give, I gave you an extra, enough room. Um, so it wasn't on purpose. And three, obviously you're going through a tough time right now. And I didn't know that. And I apologize. You know, I'm sorry that, that this went the way that it did. And I'm on your side, you know. Um, it, but that's not what we do, right? In society, typically, right? We, um, and I'm saying typically because I, I'm just talking about that side of things. There are many people who are compassionate all the time. I know people who are like this. They're very good models for me. People who would never flip off someone on the road or, you know, they would, they, they see the foot underneath the foot, uh, underneath the wheel of the car. They see that. And when you see it, you naturally have compassion for that person. As a therapist, you need to have that. I'm telling you, you need it. You need to have that. Compassion is the key to being an effective therapist, not only in my mind, but according to evidence. And don't let anyone tell you differently. You know, cognitive behavioral therapy works, but what really works is relationship. And science has proven that. And a major component of that relationship is compassion and empathy. When that relationship is strong, as you know, uh, created through compassion and empathy, outcomes in therapy are much l more likely to be positive than if you focus on your theory, such as cognitive behavioral, or whether it's intersubjective or Jungian or you know, narrative or whatever. If you focus on the relationship, that's where it's going to happen. So if you want to be a good therapist, if you want to be an ethical therapist, evidence-based therapist, compassion is the key, the key. And when you understand people compassion naturally happens. That's the point. That's why I do this podcast. And that's why when this woman writes in and says that um, she appreciates that, then I consider that to be a great thing. I don't know any other way to put it. Um, uh, the purpose of my life has been realized. How about that? <laughs> How about that for grandiosity? All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it and take care of others because they do too.